Dear Heavenly Father, um, I have to confess um, that I'm a man of unclean lips and to one degree or another in the midst of an unclean people. Um, but I can say with Paul, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And if Paul could say he was the chief, um, how can I not say that with him? But Lord, you've used incredibly um, lacking people in history. And so I come to you asking for humility, for wisdom, asking for a measure of your Holy Spirit, not just for me, uh, but for each of us here. We pray, Lord, that you will increase and I and all of us will decrease so that you can be increased. We ask this in Jesus' name, because of your mercy, because of our great need. Amen. All right. Anybody recognize that? That looks sort of familiar. Yeah, it should be familiar. That's our Seventh-day Adventist logo. That's an excellent logo, I think. We've got the, the green part at the bottom, right? What's that? The Bible, right? And what's right in the middle? The cross, right? So that's, I, I don't know who designed this, but I think it's really, really good. That's fantastic. And then we've got sort of a, a wispy thing there, right? What is, what is that supposed to represent? The Holy Spirit, yeah, the flame of the Holy Spirit. And it's going up for what reason? The second coming is supposed to point to the second coming. Um, you read sort of on our, on our journal conference website, they've got a little explanation up there. I think it's kind of interesting. Um, and if you look at someone, they'll show the world. They don't always show the world, but sometimes they do. Now, why do you think they have three flames there? The three angels' messages, exactly. Yeah, it's not for the Trinity, it's for the three angels' messages. Um, so I think it's a fantastic logo. It really communicates in a very succinct manner what we, as our mission is, the foundation is the Bible, the center is the cross, our ministry is to the world, and the Holy Spirit and the three angels' messages are how we're going to accomplish that. I think it's really, really a blessing. Anybody recognize that? Well, that's our logo for this week. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Anya Kinsley and Lindy and the Planning Committee and Juanita in our office for uh, who all was involved in exactly which parts of that. But I think it's very insightful. Let's say a picture can make a thousand words or something like that. And uh, a lot of similarity to our Adventist logo. Um, any differences, though? Yeah. Yeah, Todd alluded to this in his talk on Thursday morning, but um, I almost titled this The Forgotten Angel. <laughs> we don't think about him as much, right? Um, but such an important part um, of eschatological history, it doesn't always get the same thought and attention that it should. Um, some really good talks were this week on that, but the location is slightly different too, isn't it? Again, Todd mentioned this. The three angels are in the midst of heaven around the earth, and then this fourth angel, he's coming someplace else, right? He's coming straight down from heaven. He's not in the midst of heaven. He's coming from heaven. So let's read this again uh, here for a minute or two. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, heaven having great power. Now, it's interesting. That phrase, great power, is only twice in the book of Revelation. Uh, one's re 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 uh, referring to when, when God takes uh, control of things in, Gen I'm, I'm sorry, in Revelation chapter 11. But this is the only place where that other place where that phrase great power occurs in, this, um, in the day in Revelation story. So he has great power and the earth was illuminated or enlightened with his glory. So there's, there's this powerful angel. And angels in the Bible, sometimes we we sort of turn our minds off, and what do we think of? We think, yeah, these sort of ethereal ministering spirits, they've got wings. But in Revelation 14 and 18, the angels represent who or what? God's people, right? God's people giving these messages, right? The, the glory is the message, but the messenger, we're told, is God's people. So that angels, the three angels of Revelation 13 and 14, and the angel of Revelation 18, this is really a reference to our calling. So there's coming a time in our history where there will be a message with great power. The earth will be enlightened or edified, right? An understanding will increase in this world. 
uh, of this glorious message that this four things is proclaiming. And he starts out by saying he cried mightily with a loud voice. So again, there's three of the four angels have a loud voice, right? One, three, and four. And four is basically a repetition of the first three, right? So this is, sometimes we'll call this, not the fourth angel, but the loud cry message, right? Also called the loud cry message. And he has something specific to say, Babylon the Great is fallen. Is fallen. And he goes on and describes the character of this kingdom, the character of this city. So this entity, Babylon, has become a, a dwelling place, a habitation. And this message is strong. It's, it's a habitation for demons. It's a habitation for the former angels in God's universe who bought into the deceptive lies that Satan was telling and became not just fallen angels per se, but demons. And this, this city, this Babylon, this edifice is where they live. It's their structure. And it's not just their dwelling place, but they've turned this into a prison of sorts. Not perceived so much by many people, but it's a prison. A prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. So what's going on in Babylon at this point? It's imprisonment. Now, Babylon would tell you what's going on in Babylon. Freedom and liberty. But this angel is saying, no, no, that's not where freedom, that's where prison is. That's where you'll get caged in and locked into things. And he goes on to say, all the nations and the kings and the merchants are bought into this system. So, so you just have to step back for a second and think, okay, there's, there's this worldwide system, right? All the nations, all the kings, political system, religious system, economic system of this whole world is an edifice of sort that the Bible identifies as Babylon. And this, this worldwide structure is inhabited by demonic influences and demonic principles. Now, we're sort of quick to look for political things and economic things, and I think there's a lot of important things to look at there. But I want to think for a second here just about this habitation. Now, there's two habitations going on on planet Earth. One is Babylon, which is a habitation for demons. But there's another habitation brought out in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, Dee alluded to this this, more, uh, this afternoon. He didn't read this passage, I don't remember. But there's another habitation that's being built here on planet Earth. So here's Ephesians 2, 19 through 20. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. What's the implication, right? You're no longer strangers and foreigners. You were strangers and foreigners, but no longer. But now you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, this language is going to keep developing. There's this one edifice structure, Babylon, and God's building this other edifice or structure. Paul goes on, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And that word dwelling place there is the same as the word in the fourth angel's message. So there's a dwelling place, a habitation for demons, and there's a dwelling place or a habitation for God through his Holy Spirit. So there's, there's two places to dwell in this world. One is this other edifice that is described as a cage and a prison, and then there's this other habitation that God is building it's called a building, a holy temple, a household. And all three members of the Godhead are mentioned here. Jesus Christ himself, God in the Spirit. All the members of the Trinity are mentioned in this dwelling place. So how is God building his house? How is he building this end time temple, this habitation, this dwelling place? 
Well, he's building it through communicating messages to us, communicating information, not just information to edify, but information to transform. And as you look back on our Advent history, you'll see him sequentially sending us messages to edify us, to transform us, and then by extension to give to the rest of the world. So we can go back and you can look at the first angel's message, the second angel's message, the midnight cry. Remember, that's the story of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. And, and some had their, at, at midnight a cry went forth, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. It's the midnight cry in the late, uh, mid-1844. The third angel's message began in the fall of 1844. And then something significant happens in the middle of these messages, right? So God's sending these messages, and they're building on each other. There's a, like a solo. Have you ever seen those choirs where one person starts, and then another person joins, and, a third, and, and it builds, and is more empowered as you move through on the choir as it builds. Then in the middle of these messages, a Day of Atonement ministry begins on October 22, 1844. And it's not just the Day of Atonement that begins then, right? Sometimes we, we separate these out, but that's also the beginning of the cleansing of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment, right? These are three, three facets of the period of Earth's history that we're in. We're in the day, day of Atonement. We're in the investigative judgment. We're in the cleansing of the sanctuary. And this all happens in the, ministry, in the beginning of these messages. But we're still here, right? So God had to send more messages. So he sent a message to Laodicea. And the first time we're told about Laodicea as applying to us was in the early 1850s. We'd always thought we were Philadelphia, right? We kind of want to be Philadelphia, right? The brotherly love. And, and we identified ourselves with Philadelphia through the pre-1844 era and for several years afterwards until... Advent pioneers, supported by Ellen White, said, you know what, I think, we've, I think we're in a different situation now. We're not Philadelphia anymore. We're Laodicea. Now, that's a little sobering because the message is quite sobering, isn't it? But the reality is, if, you need, if you're going to move beyond the Laodicean condition, you cannot distance yourself from it to move beyond it. There may be some, some, you'll never talk to Joel Osteen, right? He'll never identify with Laodicea. You'll never talk to John MacArthur and identify his church as Laodicea. you never talk to uh, the Stanley guy. or You'll never talk to any of these evangelicals and they'll never identify with Laodicea. There's only one church that identifies with Laodicea. And we're quite reticent to do it ourselves many times, right? But the only ones who can be delivered from Laodicean condition are the ones who acknowledge that is their condition. Amen. You can't move beyond it until you understand it and see it in yourself. It's like, it's like trying to, to treat a patient with no diagnosis. You're just shooting blindly, right? I don't know what your problem is, but things don't seem like they're going too well, but I have no idea what the problem is. You need a diagnosis. And it's the ones who identify themselves as Laodicea who have the ability to accept the remedy. So we need to be careful about distancing ourselves from, that's not me, that's not us. Because to the degree we, we hold that away from us is the degree that we may not be able to move beyond it. Well, then another message was brought, and that's called the loud cry message, or the fourth angel's message. And that began in the mid to late 1880s, we're told. Ellen White said in Great Contrary, this is the last message ever to be given to the world. Six messages, and that's the last one. And it includes all the previous ones. And it's interesting, if you read through Ellen White's material, the loud cry is al almost always, many times, associated with the latter rain. She uses those terms many times quite interchangeably. Well, let's just look at the 18th message real quickly, and we'll see that it's woven into all of these messages. The message given us by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is the message of God to the Laodicean church. And I found that message to be such a blessing. Amen. It tells me where I'm at, 
but it also tells me a beautiful gospel solution. What does that song go? To wonders I confess. We need to see two things, right? The wonders of redeeming love and my unworthiness. Laodicea, when they wake up, sees their unworthiness. But they also see the wonders of redeeming love. And that's the balance the 18th message is meant to bring to us. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to, pe- to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. Now, interestingly, and I've mentioned this before, she only uses this phrase, most precious message, in two occasions. You can read all 25 million words. She only uses it twice. One time is in reference to the 18th message of Jones and Wagner. Anybody want to guess where the other time is? And I'll give you a clue. It's a message about the cleansing of the sanctuary, the building of the temple, and the fall of Babylon, and a call to come out of her, my people. It's a message to Zerubbabel. What was going on in Zerubbabel's time, right? They were rebuilding the temple. They were calling their people out of Babylon, right? Because remember, that was, Zerubbabel was the first one, but a lot of people stayed in Babylon, right? There were actually three exits from Babylon uh, back to Israel. And that's the other time she uses that phrase, most precious message. I don't think it's by accident. Whether she knew it or the Holy Spirit was calling our attention to that, she's saying that that most precious message that Zerubbabel had was a calling out of Babylon, a call to repentance, a call to rebuild the temple, a call to the cleansing of the sanctuary. Fascinating. Well, now, what is this most precious message? Now, I find it interesting to contrast Ellen White's description of the 18th message with what I kind of read when I sort of read about it in different, you know, papers or books or articles. Now, if you just sort of, sort of float through Adventism, and, you, and I've done this, you ask me, well, what's the Adventism? Well, you know, there was some discussion about the law in Galatians and some argument about that. And, and if someone's well-informed, they would say, like, yeah, there was a debate about which of the ten horns, you know, on the beast were. You know, Jones had one opinion about the horns, and Uriah Smith had another opinion. And then other people would say, like, oh, it's righteous by faith versus legalism. Notice what Ellen White identifies as the 18th message. I think this is important. This is the message God commanded to be given to the world. Now, what is that a reference to? Matthew 24, 14, right? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then the end shall come. So there's something here that is part of that gospel commission. And she says, this is the third angel's message which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice. What is that referring to? The fourth angel, right? And attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. What do we call that? Yeah, that's, I don't even have to, sometimes we say, well, no, no, she didn't use the phrase latter rain. I said, well, what else is the outpouring of her spirit in a large measure besides the latter rain? So she's identifying this message with the third angel, the fourth angel, and the latter rain. Well, let's look briefly at this message of the fourth angel. Notice again what she identifies this as. And this is 1892. The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun. And when she reads Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12, the third angel's message, let's see what she comes away with, right? Because we tend to come away with merely Mark of the Beast and the wrath of God. And that's what we come away with primarily. I think, I think we're missing a lot there. But let's see what she comes away with. The loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth, referring to the fourth angel. I mean, process the timing. 1892, the fourth angel is beginning to proclaim his message. So things were moving, right? Things were starting to happen. Now she's going to go on and describe this third and fourth angel's message. It is the work of everyone to whom the message of warning has come 
to lift up the heirs in the beast power. We should be aware of those. But she says to lift up Jesus, to present him to the world as revealed in types, as shadows and symbols. You can go through the whole, the whole biblical story as manifest in the revelations of the prophets, as unveiled in the lessons given to the disciples and in the wonderful miracles wrought for the sons of men. Search the scriptures, for these are they which testify of Jesus. So she sums up third and fourth angel's message as lift up Jesus, the sin-pardoning Savior. All right, now I want to spend a little bit of time contrasting these two global systems. So we talked about there's this one system called Babylon. It's a habitation for demons. There's a cage for everybody there. There's a prison there for everybody. And there's this other building, this other structure, this other temple that is the habitation of God through his Holy Spirit in us. So principles of Babylon cause it to fall under the weight of its own corruption and self-destructive theological and relational realities. And we're going to develop that now in just a minute. But its underlying principles have within them self-destruction. That's why that third verse on the Watch Ye Saints one, right, said the kingdoms are, are collapsing from their foundation. One famous historian said this. He wasn't talking about, uh, about Revelation, but he said he was looking at the span of history. He's a famous British historian. He said, civilizations die from suicide, not murder. Right? That's, a, that's Gibbons is the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, right? It was internal corruption, the principles they began to develop that actually caused the fall of the pagan Roman Empire. And there's a lesson there for us, right? Civilizations tend to die from suicide, not from murder. Then there's this other system, the principles of God's end-time people who identify the rottenness at the core of Babylon and call God's people out of it and reveal what the grace of God or the gospel can produce. So these two different realities that we want to explore here for just a few minutes. Now, fundamental characteristic of Babylon. You can watch this throughout history, right? We talked about Isaiah 14, Thursday morning. I will ascend. Genesis chapter 3, Satan talking to Adam and Eve, you will be like God. Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, let us build ourselves a city. Let us make a name for ourselves. You seeing a pattern already? Daniel chapter 4, is not this great Babylon that I have built by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, showing himself that he is God, speaking about the Antichrist. And then again, Revelation 18, which we just uh, were referring to, but this is later in that chapter. She glorified herself. I sit as a queen and am no widow. So you see a pattern there, this characteristic of Babylon. These are all facets of Babylon, but it's, it's one picture, right? It's one reality. The principle of self-exaltation or self-preservation. There's sort of two sides of the same coin, right? I either promote myself to get ahead or for whatever reason, I need to preserve myself. And we'll unpack that in just a minute here. But all of these entities that we went through here, they all end up in the same place, right? They all fall. They all promote themselves, and they all end up falling. Babylon fell after Nebuchadnezzar. The Antichrist will fall. Tower of Babel fell. All these things, as they were promoting themselves, preserving themselves, fell. So they all end up in the same place. As I mentioned, number two for Babylon is self-preservation. Isaiah 58, hiding yourself from your own flesh. Why would you do that? Why would you hide yourself from yourself? We'll explore this just a minute. It's to preserve yourself. You can't process what you have to process if you weren't hiding yourself. We make lies our refuge. We have to tell lies about ourselves and others to preserve ourselves. Because the other alternative is exposure of ourselves, which is extremely uncomfortable because many times that leads to guilt and shame. And Hebrews 2 says, those who fear, through fear were all their lifetime subject to bondage. This is where addictions come from, right? You can't deal with the reality of your surroundings either because of things you've done or things other people have done to you, and you latch on to something else to blind your mind. 
It's interesting when, when, when Ellen White describes Lucifer's experience in the thousand years in the, in the millennium, says he has no one left to tempt and he's forced to reflect on his experience. He's stuck thinking about everything. She says when he's been really busy doing things around the world, he didn't have to reflect on things. He didn't have to think about things. He could just be busy advancing his kingdom. But when there's no one left to drag down, no one left to have, he's just left to himself, reflection begins to dawn on him. No more can he have lies as a refuge. No more can he hide himself from himself. So when you have these two entities, self-exaltation and self-preservation, you build this structure called the papacy. Now, the papacy is just this. It's the ultimate communal manifestation of the universal human desire to exalt self or preserve self above all others, including God. It's just a community of people buying into a certain philosophy about life. Exalt oneself or preserve oneself. And it's just a religious structure built along that one principle. And White describes this in Mount of Blessing, page 79. Listen to this. And I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. She talks about the Pharisees, but I'm going to insert papacy there. The principles cherished by the Pharisees, or the papacy, are such as are characteristic of humanity in all ages. The spirit of Pharisaism is the spirit of human nature. The spirit of the papacy, the spirit of self-promotion, self-preservation, self-exaltation, that's the spirit of human nature. So, so when Babylon or the papacy or Pharisaism or any of these worldly systems want to promote themselves, they have a tremendous advantage because they're working in harmony with human nature. Anything that appeals to the self-preservation, self-exaltation motive is completely in harmony with our human nature, so it's an appeal for us. We're happy to join into it by nature. What they're selling is completely in harmony. Luther picked up on this, right? Martin Luther picked up on this. I'm, I'm afraid, I'm more afraid of my own heart than of the Pope and all his cardinals. I have within me the great Pope. <laughs> Self. So, so that big system, now the papacy is just one manifestation of Babylon, right? You can see it in the advertising world. You can see it, as we mentioned the other day, anything, any adjective before pride. Blank, pride. When you hear that phrase, that's Babylon in one, some way, shape, or form, right? We mentioned there's only one thing we're to boast in. Jesus Christ and him crucified, right? I'll boast in nothing else but Jesus Christ. That's the only thing we can have, quote, pride in. Nothing else to glory, nothing else to have pride in. So Luther recognized that what he was really up against, yes, it's a worldly system with all of its structures, but the real problem that was at the root of what he was dealing with was within himself. And that's why it's easier to get someone out of Babylon than to get Babylon out of us. Because, you know, if, when you do evangelism, it's, it's a lot easier to get them out of Babylon into Adventism. But Ellen White talks about people being, quote, buried alive, unquote. Because we haven't gotten Babylon out of them and maybe probably not even out of us, right? That's the whole purpose, right? We're needing to come out of, get Babylon out of us to some degree. My wife's mother is from the West Indies in Trinidad and she grew up in a rural area and they would jokingly call it the bush. Okay, well. <laughs> and then, you know, so years pass, and now we're all at family gatherings, and, you know, the, like parents do, they say odd things every once in a while. And they would say, it's easier to get mommy out of the bush than get the bush out of mommy. Because some of those things seem sort of archaic or, or colloquial that she would say and do. 
And it's the same problem here, right? It's easier to change someone's location than it is to change what's in their heart. All right, let's run through a few of Babylon's principles here. Here's one of them, back in the Garden of Eden. Adam said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree. And Eve said, the serpent whom you created deceived me. Now, why did Adam say, the woman whom you gave me? In fact, why did he even mention Eve at all? Exactly. He needed to shift blame from himself to something else, to someone else. And Eve needed to do the same thing. So one of Babylon's principles is, I need to shift responsibility away from myself to someone else. Because if I don't, then I have to deal with the guilt and responsibility. This is one of Babylon's principles. And that's why it's so popular in the world. Guilt is the most lethal force in the universe. You know, with COVID, we had this thing called a case fatality ratio. If you get COVID and you're in a certain demographic age or whatever, what, how likely are you to die from it? Guilt, untreated, has a 100% case fatality ratio. Gethsemane and Calvary teach us the case fatality ratio of guilt. That's the one place we see guilt doing its ultimate work. So we have to shift responsibility. Ellen White describes it this way. They must have some means of quieting their consciences. Because when conscience is awake, I'm feeling uncomfortable, I'm feeling guilty, I'm feeling fear, I'm feeling shame. I need some way to quiet that. And one way to quiet that is to shift responsibility. Shift it to others, shift it to God, shift it to circumstances, shift it to genetics. And if you just watch the conversations in the world, you'll see all this shifting of responsibility. And it's all an attempt to quiet consciousness, quiet conscience, and avoid responsibility. Calvary alone can reveal the terrible enormity of sin. If we had to bear our own guilt, it would crush us. If Adam and Eve in the garden had to bear their guilt, it would have crushed them. That's why they needed a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And that slaying process began with them shifting responsibility to God and God saying, okay, you can stick it on me. I'll take the blame because you can't deal with that right now. Then we'll go through a process with you of bringing you to repentance, bringing you to see your true situation, helping you to grow up. But if they dealt with it in that moment, it would have crushed them. Another of Babylon's principles. Oh, actually, notice this. So this is Ellen White commenting on our understanding of why there's a delay. Listen to this. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years, as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake... Now, now she's not swearing here, right? She's appealing to us. She's saying... For, for Jesus Christ's sake, don't do this. For Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. Now, why would we charge God with our own wrong course of action? Because the, we don't want to accept that responsibility, right? It's heavy. The guilt and, and shame... And responsibility is, is almost crushing. This is why when the conversation about a delay comes up, people have a hard time saying there's a delay and we might have played a part in that. It's much easier to say, oh, God's sovereign. He picked the time. Hard to know when it is. God's, it's, he's got his own timetable. What am I doing? I'm shifting responsibility. This is Satan's primary action too, justifying himself. The aim of the great rebel has been to has ever been to justify himself and to prove the divine government responsible for his rebellion. 
To this end, to justify himself, he has bent all the power of his giant intellect. He has worked deliberately and systematically and with marvelous success, leading vast multitudes to accept his version of the great controversy, which has been so long in progress. So this works for a while, but we know from Isaiah 14, this isn't going to last forever, right? There's going to become a great shifting. Isaiah talks about a sweeping away of the refuge of lies. And then this is what, this is what happens to Lucifer and uh, to Satan in Isaiah 14. Those who see you, this is Isaiah 14, remember? I will be like the Most High, this chapter. It's all about Lucifer's self-promotion, self-exaltation. But where does that chapter end? Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? Remember, remember that fourth angel's message, right? Habitation for demons and a cage and a prison. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness, destroyed its cities, and did not open the house of his prisoners? Remember the cage in the prison in Revelation 18? You have destroyed your land and slain your people. There's going to be a great shifting of understanding in the universe and amongst everyone. Who's responsible for all this? He's been spending all his time justifying himself, but that's going to change in the end. Another of Babylon's principles. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. We dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Now, have you ever seen this? Comparing ourselves. This is the basis of gossip, right? We compare ourselves amongst ourselves. And you can do this in a secular world, for promotions or athletics or whatever, or you can do it in the religious world. Well, how come he's an elder and I'm just a deacon? Well, how come that person gets to help out at communion? Why do I have to do the potluck pickup and they teach Sabbath school? Those are just some simple examples, right? But we do this, right? We compare ourselves amongst ourselves, finding something negative in someone so we can elevate ourselves a little bit, or finding something positive in ourselves to accentuate a little more. Because we're, otherwise, we sort of have to deal with ourselves as we really are. And that can be quite nerve wracking to see ourselves just as we are. And Theodore Roosevelt. Comparison is the thief of joy. Paul was just telling us that, right? Don't compare yourselves amongst yourselves. That's one of Babylon principles. Compare ourselves with each other. If you're going to compare, there's only one place to compare yourself to, right? And that's with Jesus Christ. And when you compare yourself with him, you're going to come up short. But those two wonders, the wonders of redeeming love, will encourage you that then you can face your unworthiness. Okay, another one of Babylon's principles. Then the eyes of Adam and Eve were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now, why did they do this? They had to deal with shame, right? And that's a physical metaphor for a spiritual problem. In the Great Contrary, it says this, the papacy is prepared for two classes of mankind, embracing nearly the whole world. Again, here's this vast edifice again, right? Babylon, just this, all the religious systems, national systems, economic systems, this whole world, those who would be saved by their merits, like Adam and Eve making their fig leaves, and those who would be saved in their sins. Because these are two ways of dealing with guilt and shame, right? Number one, you tell lies about yourself. You make fig leaves for yourself to cover yourself up so you don't have to feel so uncomfortable about yourself in self-righteousness. Or you just say, it doesn't matter. That doesn't apply to me. I'm born this way. Whatever, it doesn't apply. Those two methods of, of saving ourselves. Here is the secret of its power. Those two methodologies. Now listen to this. They must, she goes on, they must have some means of quieting their consciences and they seek that which is least spiritual and humiliating. 
Now listen to this. What they desire is a method of forgetting God which shall pass as a method of remembering him. Now what's going on here, right? And it's kind of sobering, right? It's, it's almost like we want to do enough religion to quiet our conscience, but not so much religion that self is actually crucified. Right? That's what's going on. And, and if you just look at the religious systems of the whole world, Christianity, outside Christianity, that's what's going on. You do whatever it is, whatever behavioral worship, whatever thing, to quiet conscience enough so you can feel secure enough to proceed through your life, but not so invested that actual self which is in you dies. Because the goal is to to survive, for self to survive, and I need to have some therapy to do that, and therapy that is the least humiliating and the least spiritual. That's what's going on. This is Laodicea's problem, right? They're quite busy on a religious level, right? The faithful truth says, I know your works. You're very active. But are you doing it because you love Jesus or because you're trying to quiet your conscience? And you feel better about yourself. You don't have to deal with the underlying issues if you're sort of religiously busy and active. God help us, we're all at risk for this. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers in themselves, and this is what you get. You have a form of godliness, but there's no power in the experience. You may look very, we may look very edifying on the outside to varying degrees, right? There's all sorts of, you can be a long list Christian or a short list Christian, whatever you think you need to quiet your conscience, but underlying that, do we love Jesus? Possessing supremacy in guilt. This is how Babylon, this is how Satan manipulates us. He uses the guilt that is associated with sin to maintain supremacy over over us, to get us to buy into addictive behaviors, to get us to buy into religious systems that allow us to quiet our conscience without actually buying in to the principles of his kingdom, of self-sacrificing love. That's why you can have groups of people that engage in the passing pleasures of sin and they feel guilty and then they have to do it again because they don't want to deal with the guilt. They want that passing, a little more dopamine so I don't have to deal with the guilt anymore. That's what's going on in all of those situations. And then on the other side, we're told, listen, if you just do these religious things, Guilt will be taken away. But the problem is the only way you can ultimately take away guilt, the only way God can take away guilt is by taking away the sin. He can't, guilt and sin are connected. So he can't take away the guilt and the sin is still there. That's why in the cleansing of the sanctuary, he takes the sin away. He doesn't just pacify it. He doesn't say, don't worry about that. He says, the only way I can ultimately free you from the guilt and its consequences is to take the sin away from you. Because sin is the problem. Here's motivation. There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law, to form a right character, and to secure salvation. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. If I just do this quiet my conscience thing long enough, hopefully God will buy into this and I can get to heaven. It's a very sort, of, very sort of depressing picture of God, right? God wants you, God's got this test. You need to perform some religious things and, and some behaviors, then you get to go to heaven. God's very small in that picture. He doesn't care about your heart or your mind or your affections or your honor or your friendship. Just comply with the behavioral things that I've told you to comply with, and then I'll give you a reward. It's a very Santa Claus picture of, uh, of experience. She says, such religion is worth nothing. The man who attempts to keep the commands of God from a sense of obligation merely because he's required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. So this is, this is 
the way Babylon does motivation. And this isn't just Christianity. If you look at Islam or Judaism or any of these other religious systems or atheism, right? These are all based on these same types of principles. And true Christianity has a very different principle, right? And White says that it's not the hope of, it's not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. They behave the Savior's matchless love revealed from the manger in Bethlehem to Calvary's cross. The sight of him attracts, they hear his voice and they follow him. That's a very different religious experience, isn't it? That's that other habitation that God is trying to build in Ephesians chapter 2. There's the obligation, fear of reward, hope of pun- I'm sorry, hope of reward, fear of punishment reality, or there's the sight of him attracts. He's beautiful. I want to follow him. Now we quote this, where this is the love of God and we keep his commandments, period. But that's not the period, is it? The love of God has two components. We keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Now if you have a strong willpower, you can do the first part. If you don't have a strong willpower, you're, you're stuck on the first one. But even if you have a strong willpower, you can't do the second one by willpower alone. Can a leopard change his sock? Can an Ethiopian change his skin? Then may you who are accustomed to evil do good. What he's saying there isn't that you can't just change your behavior. He's saying you can't change your heart. It's only the gospel that can change your heart. Commandments are not burdensome. All right, so what's the answer to Babylon's principles? Well, if the problem is primarily political or economic, then we would look for a political or economic solution. But if the problem is a spiritual, relational, perceptual problem, then the solution would be a spiritual, emotional, intellectual solution, right? So Ellen White says this is the solution. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. Gospel problem in Babylon, gospel solution. This is why the third angel's message is justification by faith, because Babylon is filled with these, with these intellectual, spiritual problem realities that we've bought into one degree or another. So the solution has to be a gospel solution. Is justification by the third angel's message? I have answered it is the third angel's message in verity. The third angel's message is a lot more than identifying the beast and what the mark is. It has as much or more to do with identifying the gospel. The prophet declares, and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven. So now she's identifying the fourth angel in harmony with the third angel. Now, one brief comment about the fall of Babylon. So Babylon fell. This is with Belshazzar. That's the Cyrus um, cylinder there. So I don't know if Dr. Hossel talked about that at all in the archaeology sem- uh, seminar. I mean, the... Uh, the afternoon seminar, but on October 12, 539 B.C., that was the day of Belshazzar's feast, and that's when Babylon fell. Now, guess what happened immediately before Belshazzar's feast? October 7, five days before, the fall of Babylon was the Day of Atonement. So what was Daniel doing five days before the fall of Babylon? He was engaged in the Day of Atonement work. The Day of Atonement experience precedes the historical and final fall of Babylon. And that's why we're we're in the antitypical Day of Atonement leading to the fall of Babylon, just like Daniel had the Day of Atonement immediately before the fall of Babylon, five days before. So hopefully pastors were familiar with Leviticus 16 and Leviticus 23. On the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls. And on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins. Well, how does that happen? How do we have a day atonement experience? Remember we're talking about laying aside all those sins in Leviticus? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And notice, the Bible is going to give us the same solutions that Ellen White talked about in reference to the 18th message and to the fourth angel's message. Same solution. Looking unto Jesus... 
As one, as one pastor said, you will never stamp sin out. You can only crowd it out. Lay aside every weight and the sin which easily besets us, ensnares us. How do you do that? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners. Looking to Jesus. Here's another part of the form. Titus 2, 11 to 12. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, so grace is teaching us something, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. What, what's the trigger for us to be able to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts? What's the causative agent for that? The grace of God. So if I want victory over sin, if I want the day of atonement experience, where do I need to keep my attention focused? On the grace of God. That's why the 1888 message is first and foremost about Jesus. And why it says many had, many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their, their attention directed back to his divine purpose and his changeless merits. Romans 2.4. Don't you see how wonderful, kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? That's the NIV. Don't you know that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Do you see the pattern here? There's, it, I, don't, I don't like the word formula, but there's a formula for this experience, this day of atonement experience. The love of Christ compels us because we judge us that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live... So the love of Christ is going to do something. It's compel us to... That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Joan says it this way. It's a great passage. Brethren, if any of you have got into discouragement, let us quit. This is 1893 General Conference session. If the Lord has brought up sins to us that we never thought of before, that only shows that he is going down to the depths and he will reach the bottom at last. Praise the Lord. And when he finds the last thing that is unclean or impure and that is out of harmony with his will and brings that up and shows that to us and we say, I would rather have Jesus than that. This is how, this is how God gives us freedom, gives us healing, gives us cleansing. I would rather have Jesus than that. Then the work is complete and the seal of the living God can be fixed upon that character. Congregation was impressed. He goes on, which, which would you rather have, a character? And then the transcriber is interjecting what's going on here. Someone in the congregation began praising the Lord, and others began to look around. Who's praising the Lord in our general conference session? That's not appropriate. And Jones goes on, never mind. If lots more of you would thank the Lord for what you've got, there would be more joy in this house tonight. He goes on, which would you rather have? the completeness, the perfect fullness of Jesus Christ, or have less than that with some of your sins covered up that you never knew of. Congregation, his fullness. It wasn't just somebody yelling. It's like, the whole congregation, his fullness. And so, he got, and so he has got to dig down to the deep places we never dreamed of because we cannot understand our hearts. That's all the principles we went through with Babylon. That's we, the reason we went through those because we can't understand our hearts. We need to see these principles that Babylon has woven into our experience. And now God's going to go down and get rid of those things. We're not going to compare ourselves amongst ourselves anymore because now I see it. I'm not going to try and quiet my conscience anymore with a religious sort of veneer because if that's not happening from my heart, then I need to go back and deal down the heart level with it. So all those principles that Babylon has inculcated to blind our minds... God wants to dig down and and get rid of those. So he's got to dig down to the deep places we never dreamed of because we cannot understand our hearts. But the Lord knows the heart. He tries the conscience. He will cleanse the heart and bring up the last vestige of wickedness. Let him go on, brethren. Let him keep on his searching work, and when he does bring your sins before us, let the heart say, Lord, thou gavest thyself for my sins. Oh, I take thee instead of them. They are gone, and I rejoice in the Lord. What a great sermon. It's from the 1893 sermons. You can purchase them in the bookstore. Really, really, this is just a sample, but wonderful. So Babylon is fallen. And we're called to identify for people Babylon's fall. We're not to destroy Babylon, right? Babylon's going to fall on its own. Its foundations are corrupt. 
But we're to call people out of that fallen structure. And that's why we're told to, in verse 4 of Revelation 18, come out of her, my people. And Owen makes this comment, notwithstanding the spiritual darkness and alienation from God that exists in the churches which constitute Babylon, the great body of Christ's true followers are still to be found in their communion. The majority of God's true followers are still out there, and we have a message to call them out. And it's not merely a message, it's not even primarily a message of who the beast is, what the mark is, as important as those are and as much as we need to identify those, it's primarily a message of the gospel. That's what's going to call them out. Ellen White then describes it, this this day of atonement, anti-Babylon calling in these terms. What beauty of character shown forth in the daily life of Christ. He is to be our pattern. There is a great work to be done in fashioning a character after the divine similitude. The grace of Christ must mold the entire being and its triumph will not be complete until the heavenly universe shall witness. Now notice, notice this day of atonement, anti-Babylon calling. Till there's a witness of habitual tenderness of feeling, Christ-like love and holy deeds in the deportment of the children of God. Such a, such a genuine, basic reality in Christian experience. This is what will call the people out of Babylon, the habitual tenderness of feeling, Christ-like love, and holy deeds in our deportment. I'm going to take five more minutes and read one of my favorite passages from the 18th message. And as I read through this, it's going to be familiar to some of you, um, maybe to several of you. Notice that Jones is going to describe two groups of people here. One is the people that are, that are, that are in Babylon, but they're doing religion. Okay? He's going to describe that people first. Then he's going to describe the people on God's side of the controversy, those who've made them a habitation for God in the Spirit. Now notice how this progresses here. It's a wonderful, wonderful quote. So we're going to see Babylon and the Day of Atonement experiences side by side contrasted with each other. Again, this is 1893 sermons again. Are we not right in the time of the sealing? <laughs> Yeah, they, they, they bought into this, and I think justifiably so, right? They were getting counsel from Ellen White um, about being in the time of the latter reign, the events in the world around them. They were saying, this is the time, this is the time of the sealing. And when that is passed, this time of the sealing, then entrance into the heavenly city, entrance into the heavenly city, thank the Lord. There are tests that we are to pass through, but brethren, when we have this righteousness of Jesus Christ, we have that which will pass through every test. And in that day, there are going to be two parties there. There are going to be some there when the door is shut, and they will want to go in, and they will say, Lord, open to us. We want to come in. He's sort of telling an allegory here, that there's two groups coming up to the heavenly city, and they both want to come in. And someone comes from the city and asks, what have you done that you should come in? What right have you to enter the inheritance here? What claim have you upon that? Oh, we are acquainted with you. We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. Yes, besides that, we have prophesied in thy name. In thy name we have cast out demons, and in thy name we have done many wonderful works. Why, we have done many wonderful things. Lord, is that not evidence enough? Open the door. What is the answer? Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I mean, that is what Jesus says in that context, right? Because it was, it was all done in that, that Babylon framework of doing religion. All those principles we went through, that's how Babylon does religion. What did they say? They had a fig leaf, right? We have done many wonderful works. We have done them. We are all right. We are righteous. We are just exactly right. Therefore, we have a right to be there. Open the door. But we does not count there, does it? There's going to be another company there that day, a great multitude that no man can number, all nations and kindreds and tongues and people, and they will come up to enter in. And if anyone should ask them that question, what have you done that you should enter here? What claim have you here? The answer would be, I have not done anything at all to deserve it. 
I am a sinner dependent only on the grace of the Lord. Now, now let me ask you a question. These two groups, has this second group done the same things that the first group had done? Yeah, if we saw them, we would say, this group is just as busy as the other group. The only difference is, is their perception of what it was done for and how it was done. Dependent only on the grace of the Lord. I was so wretched. Now he's going he's to delineate this in terms of the Laodicean message. I was so wretched, so completely a captive and in such a bondage that nobody could deliver me but the Lord himself. So miserable that all I could ever do was to have the Lord constantly to comfort me. So poor that I had constantly to beg from the Lord. So blind that no one but the Lord could cause me to see. So naked that no one could clothe me but the Lord himself. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. All the claim that I have is what Jesus has done for me, but the Lord has loved me. When in my wretchedness I cried, he delivered me. When in my misery I wanted comfort, he comforted me all the way. When in my poverty I begged, he gave me riches. When in my blindness I asked him to show me the way, that I might know the way, he led me all the way and made me to see. When I was so naked that no one could clothe me, why he gave me this garment that I have on. And so all I can present and all that I have to present as that upon which I can enter, any claim that would cause me to enter is just that what he has done for me. And if that will not pass me, then I, and I am left out, and that will be just too. If I am left out, I have no complaint to make. That's the attitude. Remember, remember Satan wanted to be taken back into heaven? And when, God, when Jesus said, no, your heart has changed, he didn't say, that's just, you're right, I don't deserve to be here. But these people recognize they don't deserve to be here. If that will not pass me, then I am left out, that will be just too. If I am left out, I have no complaint to make. But oh, will not this entitle me to enter and possess the inheritance? But he says, well, there are some very particular persons here. They want to be fully satisfied with everybody that goes by here. We have 10 examiners here. When they look into a man's case and say that he is all right, why, then he can pass. Are you willing that these shall be called to examine into your case? And we shall answer, yes, yes, because I want to enter in and I am willing to submit to any examination because even if I am left out, I have no complaint to make. I am lost anyway when I am left to myself. Well, he says, we will call them. And so those 10 are brought up and they say, why, yes, we are perfectly satisfied with him. Why, yes, the deliverance that he obtained from his wretchedness is that which our Lord wrought. The comfort that he had all the way and that he needed so much is that which our Lord gave. The wealth that he has, whatever he has, poor as he was, the Lord gave it. And blind, whatever he sees, it is the Lord that gave it to him, and he sees only what is the Lord's. And naked as he was, the garment that he has on, the Lord gave it to him. The Lord wove it, and it is all divine. It is only Christ. Why, yes, he can come in. And then the transcription is inserts here, the congregation began singing. So, so the, the host didn't get up and say, you know, Don didn't come and say, hey, let's have Jesus paid it all for closing him. There was a spontaneous arising as they, as they processed the gospel that Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. He sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Should we sing that? Todd? Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And then, brethren, there will come over the gates a voice of sweetest music, Full of the gentleness and compassion of my Savior, the voice will come from within. Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Congregation, Amen. <laughs> why standest thou without? The gate will be swung wide open, and we will have an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. W. David Prescott was the floor person that night. He says, the times of refreshing are here. What was he, what was he in W. David Prescott's mind, what was he thinking when he, he listened to this sermon? His heart was moved, and he says that times of refreshing air. What was he thinking was going on? The latter rain was being poured out. 
That was the experience they were feeling. The times of refreshing are here, brethren. The Spirit of God is here. Open the heart. Open the heart. Open the heart in praise and thanksgiving. That's what we want to do. We want to open the heart in praise and thanksgiving for the beautiful gospel truths that God has given to us. This is going to happen again. And I pray not very long away. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, though the messenger uh, is inadequate, the message is beautiful. And may we be aligning ourselves with the principles of your kingdom. May we see ourselves as we truly are. Lay hold of the healing that's in the gospel. To not hide ourselves from ourselves, not take refuge in lies about ourselves or others. Um, but just confess those two wonders, the wonders of redeeming love and my unworthiness. May this Sabbath accomplish those two works for us. We feel like we're, as Newton, Isaac Newton said, on the shore of an ocean um, with the vast majority of, of knowledge of your goodness out there. And we don't want to miss any of that, Lord. So we invite you into our Sabbath. We invite you into our hearts individually. We invite you into our hearts corporately. Uh, may we see your love for us and, and hate the sin that's still residing there. We want to let you go down uh, layer by layer in our experience. And every step we want to say, I'd rather have Jesus than that. May we spend the Sabbath with you in Jesus' name. Amen.